Habakkuk, uh, it's going to take you a little while to find it. Chapter 3, verse 17. Thank you, Ben. <coughs> Wonderful. Hey, ben. <laughs> Wonderful. There's a... Uh, when, when I'm looking through Scripture, and I'm, I'm sure many of you this way, you put yourself in the place of who you're reading about. If it's John who's in love... And sharing the love of Christ, you, you, you sense that. If it's Peter walking on the water, you fill the tub up that far and close the door and give it a shot. If whatever it is, when I'm reading and I, when I see Jesus enduring, I think about endurance and pressing through. Uh, the, when I mention that God hates me, I know, I know how much God loves me. I'm one of his most favorite kids in the world. You know, I know that. You know, I don't, I don't try to hide that. But there's a flip side to, to this whole thing. It does rain on the just and the unjust. It, the, the floods that happen, the fires. Uh, I was on the news a couple of weeks ago. One of the things that they didn't mention was that, that I said, our structures are still here. The Bahamas and Puerto Rico, they're gone. You know, we have a structure to work with. It, and, and to be an American, let me be honest with you. How do you pity yourself? You're on the greatest nation on God's green earth, this is this we are blessed. So the only thing that was shifted in me when I when we had Hurricane Harvey, I had this poor me attitude in some ways. It's like, come on, man, this is terrible, and and just kind of. And this time it hit, I I wasn't cynical, but I found myself laughing, and smiling, and going, "Is that the best you got?" And we don't want this thing. Once you think we're gonna quit now. I mean, we're not going to quit now. You know, uh, you, some of your businesses were flooded. Some of your homes, I know that. Uh, we have people that are watching me right now online whose homes were flooded. They're still working on them on a Sunday morning, but they're watching this church service, or they'll pick it up again. And the last thing they need to hear when they go online is to hear some gloom and doom, poor me, amen, attitude about something that took place. We're going to get through this. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Let me tell you something else. You're going to get through whatever it is you're fighting right now. Many of you are fighting certain diseases and ailments and and angst and, and you've got certain relational issues that are going on you're dealing with family members all these things we're going to get through all this but the one thing I found out the word of God doesn't change what it does it changes us and it shifts our attitude Habakkuk when you study about Habakkuk it's somewhere around 605 BC thereabouts and we, we can't be sure of the precise year but the man Habakkuk we know almost nothing we assume he's around 30 years of age he's a contemporary with with the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah he's probably 15 years older than Daniel so he, he's someone who has some, some spiritual clout to him and when he saw the terrible moral, uh, moral decline of Judah he prayed to God to do something just like many of you have with America we've seen the decline I was just in California I was in a great place in California northern California and I'm not telling you that California is any worse than New York but I can tell you this Texas is still a long way from both of them right now but there is a decline going on a moral decline that's taking place a, a just giving in a whatever say Sarah you just let it go and, and that's not the will of God nor do I want us to become self-righteous that we got it all together because we don't we need Jesus we need a God that will stand up with us and for us and that in our lives that we can believe that, that uh, idols will fall, people will turn to him, that the love of God will flow and mercy will have its day. And I'm telling you, this man Habakkuk saw something coming. And when he saw it coming, he couldn't stop it. And there are times I stand back and I say, God, I'm going to try to stop the impending judgment that's coming on this nation. It is coming. By the way, I, I, I could open my phone and read this to you, but I, I just found uh, that one of the greatest moves of God right now on the earth is taking place nowhere else but the nation of Iran. That in Iran, that the churches have exploded. The mosques are empty. Allah is dead. Well, listen, and, I, and I, don't, I don't say it to start death threats in my own life. I'm just telling you, there is no God as Allah. There, 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 he doesn't exist. There is our Father, whose Son is Christ Jesus. Amen. And that's it. So it's, it's connecting and understanding that. Now watch this. It's ma mainly led by women. And if anyone finds out, of course, they're persecuted, raped, murdered, removed from their families, and yet they won't shut up. And, and this is the part... I, I do need to read this to you. 
Because we got time. We ain't got two churches. We got one church today. Amen. We all gathered up in here. But, you, but when I read this, I was blown away. Come on. Where is he? Y'all got a smartphone? Not smart enough to use it. My goodness. It left me. Did I? Did I? Did I? Did I? Somebody been messing with my phone. Jill. Ah, oh, there it is. There it is. The difference in what's going on in Iran and America is two different words. Disciples and converts. We are very good at making converts in America. When a service is over, we lift our hand, we pray, we become converts. We become believers. But I've told you that we go from believers to disciples to Christian. And what's happened in Iran is the word disciple. And what's the difference? Disciples forsake the world. And cling to Jesus. This is what the woman pastor in Iran said. Forsake the world and cling to Jesus till he comes. Converts don't. The leader said disciples aren't engaged in a culture war. Converts are. Disciples cherish, obey, and share the word of God. Converts don't. Disciples choose Jesus over everything and everything else. Converts don't. Converts run when the fire comes. Disciples don't. I'm reading that. I'm convicted. I mean, I'm convicted because we, we go on about our merry ways. We hit Sunday morning and think, okay, God, we've given everything we can. But th- that's not the God we serve. He's 24-7. Amen. And he's looking at our lives and saying, Lord, I want to be more like you. And, and I pray that convicts you the way it did me. Because this is what's turning their world upside down. Knowing that if they get caught preaching, if they get caught with the Bible, something's going to happen. Habakkuk said this when he saw the Babylonians fixing to come. Amen. He made this statement at the end of chapter 3. Though the fig tree does not bud. This scripture came to me again this week. Just jumped all over me. And there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails. And the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen. And no cattle in the stalls. Stay stay right there. Go back to that. I want you to see it again. This is economy. There's no. the, the, The fig tree's not budding. I was just in Northern California. You're talking about the vineyards and the fields and the produce that feeds this nation coming out of there's no feet, there's no grapes on the vine, no olive crops, amen. In other words, no oil, no, no food, no sheep. The stalls are empty, the barns are empty. Then Habakkuk said, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God, my Savior. If Habakkuk can say that about an economy that collapses, then surely I can stand in the face of a flood and say, God, you are so good to me. Yeah. You saved my family, my dog, amen, everything. I mean, you're, you're a blessing in my life. Hey, hallelujah. I can stand and rejoice. Come on, give God one more praise. In other words, the circumstances in life may not change around you, but you change. And if you change, that's enough. You know, I've gone through things in life where it looked like, okay, I, I remember when I adopted Mandy, my daughter. We were going to lose her after the adoption. And I did not know if we would even be able to keep her. We found her birth mother, got papers signed. It was, it was a crazy, mixed up time in my life. But the bottom line is this. I remember that the, the lawyer looked at me and he said those famous words. Your daughter is your privilege, not your possession. And I realized that about our children. They're a privilege. Amen. They're not our possession. So it's important for us to realize that and, and to thank God. Our buildings, they're not our possessions. You're not going to get to keep those. Amen. You're not going to keep your business. You're not going to keep that hot rod car. <laughs> them Harleys. You get the, the privilege to ride them and enjoy them. Amen. Just a little, by, little bit. Amen. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you, God, that, that you're going to shift and change some things in this house today. And those that are watching online, we dearly thank you for them. In Jesus' name, everybody be seated but Jill. But most of you know, this is my daughter. Jill will be leaving this week. Oh, please don't. She'll get the big head. Jill will be leaving this week, going to uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, to connect with a group of Oral Roberts students to go to uh, South Dakota, to the Lakota Nation, to minister there on a little mission trip. Amen. Stretch your hands toward her, please. Father, we thank you for the change that's going to take place in 
this young lady's life as she travels into a, a place of God of deprivation, a place of isolation, a place of poverty that needs the light. They need the gospel. They need the salt. So we send her forth as that. We thank you, God, that you use her. That compassion reign in her. That is her gift. That's what you've blessed her with. So, God, we pray that you use her for your glory. Let this trip be one of security there and back in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you, little sister. Your mother's going to be taking care of your dog while you're gone. Not on me. Nothing changed on the outside for Habakkuk. Nothing. But Habakkuk changed on the inside. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 2. Habakkuk asked the question. How long, O oh Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. How long do I call and you do not listen? I remember when Hurricane Harvey hit. I stood on the road. And that water was coming up the road. And I said, you're going to stop right there. In Jesus' name. God, stop that water right there. And then a few minutes later, <laughs> Lord, stop that water right there. That water got to stop right there. I pray a little bit more. Jesus, stop that water right there. Right there. Don't let that water come. It stop, God, right there. How long, oh God, must I call for help? How long do I cry and you don't listen? Amen. Violence is taking place. This is what Habakkuk began to cry. It wasn't just a flood. Violence was taking place. People were dying. People were being murdered. Something was going on. And then he goes on to say, amen, that, that uh, he said, you make me look at injustice. Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife. There's conflict around. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked him in the righteous so that justice is perverted. We see this again, not in just America, but around the world. We see this injustice that is taking place. And, 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 and each culture has their own reason to cry out, by the way. Everybody got their own reason to say something about it. And I can tell you, what happened during 9-11 when, when those buildings collapsed? People turned toward God. Buildings were filled up. But here's the problem. They turned toward God and not to God. During the calamity, they turn. They say, God, help us, help us. And a lot of us in life, when things go wrong, we turn to God or toward God, but we don't turn to him. We don't, we don't make him the all in all in our life. We turn in his direction, but we did not repent of our national sins. We turn toward God. You know, turning toward God is good, but it never lasts. Turning to him is what changes us. It's an honest question. But in Psalm chapter 10, verse 1, Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself uh, in times of trouble? David speaking. David was a man after God's own heart. He understood God, and yet there was a time he said, God, I don't know why you're standing so far from me. I would like to get a little closer to you. I'm seeking after you. I'm pressing in, but in a time of trouble, I need you. This was Habakkuk's life right here. The other question is, how did the prophet move from his initial worry? How do we move from worry and anxiety to a place of confidence, getting our joy back, our praise back? How do we get there when nothing else around us changes? The people are still mocking God. Violence still fills the streets. We're still going to find out the Babylonians are coming to Jerusalem. Outwardly, everything is just as messed up as it was. Nothing has changed on the outside. Yet this prophet, this man of God, begins to change on the inside. Situations may not change, but we have to. The outline is simple. There's a prayer. There's a vision. And then there's a testimony. First, there's a prayer. Everybody say pray. pray. When all else fails... It's really wrong, isn't it? It should be we pray first and then try everything else. But usually we try everything else and, and then we pray. His prayer was, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I heard about you. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known in wrath. Remember mercy. The Message Bible says it like this. Do among us what you did among them. Work among us as you work among them. And as you bring judgment, as surely you must, remember mercy. I, I know that the nations of the earth will be judged. I sense that. You sense it coming. But in the soul of that, we want mercy. Can I get an amen? amen? Please, God, remember. That's what he said. Remember mercy. And notice that he asked God to do it again in his day, what he had done in the past. 
One of my prayers has been, God, I want to see revival again before I die. I want to see your hand in the lives of church people again. In my life, not, 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 not in Pensacola, not in Toronto. I want to see it in Crosby, Texas, in New Caney, Texas. I want to see revival. I want to see people turn toward God. I want to see crazy stuff happen. I, I want to see people getting legitimately healed. Amen. Uh, lives coming back together, begin, being made whole. Hey, marriage is blessed. I, I want to see kids coming back to God. I want to see you smiling in church. Just once. <laughs> Come on, Ed. Give me a smile. Ed, that was pretty good. That's kind of halfway. I'm going to stay with you, though. Until... There it is. There it is. Okay, it worked. Habakkuk 1.6 says, I'm raising up, and this is what he was concerned about. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people that sweep across the whole earth to seize the dwelling places that are not their own. They are feared and dreaded people. They are like a law to themselves. They promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like a vulture, swooping down to devour. They all come bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They... Uh, deride kings, scoff at rulers, they laugh at all fortified cities, they build earthen ramps, they capture them, and they sweep past like the wind and go on and on. Guilty men whose own strength is their God. When I'm reading this, I, I, it was like, this is what God has sent to judge Israel? They're ruthless, impetuous, feared, dreaded, law to themselves, swift as leopards, ravenous as wolves, and they swoop on their prey like eagles dropping down. They mock kings. They laugh at fortified cities. They never stop. Whose strength is their God? You have to ask yourself at times, God, are we on the brink of a revival? Is something fixing to happen in this nation? Amen. Because we see nation, again, rising against nation. We see poverty in places. Uh, Timothy says that we'll see a time when our children will not honor us or respect us and turn against us. These are prophetic words about what's going to happen in this last days. And yet in the middle of all that, God begins to raise up this revival among people. Amen. But what may actually be a good sign, because revival usually comes after desperate times, you generally don't receive a miracle until you desperately need one. When's the last time you got a miracle out of the blue and you didn't ask for it? It doesn't happen. But if you're desperate for God, if you're after Him, you know, it's, it's that desperation that makes you want to get to an altar for prayer. It's that desperation that makes you want to fast. It's that desperation to believe God that something can change here. And when you hear the testimony of other people when lives have changed, then you start doing it. The vision was simple. Lord, do something. Everybody say it with me. Lord, do something. In other words, I don't have the answer for everything, but I know that you do. So this was his vision. He especially focuses on the exodus, the time in the wilderness and the crossing of the Jordan River. He had heard about it, that, that Moses come across, held up a stick, the waters parted, and the people walked across on dry ground. He heard about Pharaoh chasing in and the iron chariots and horses and the water coming back over it. If you've not seen a miracle before, can you imagine what that moment was like? That for 400 years, your daddy's 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 daddy had worked for the pharaohs, had stacked bricks and built these fine-looking pyramids. And now a deliverer comes by the name of Moses. And Moses got issues. Got, got issues. How many, many, many people re re realize that, that God quit using p p perfect people right. after Ad Ad Adam? Amen. Amen. When he realized that Adam wasn't perfect, then God said, I'll just use imperfect people. So my mom Moses has got a stuttering problem. he got issues. And God picks him in the middle of a desert with a burning bush. And Moses is running. You remember why Moses is in the desert? Two reasons. Number one, he's wanted for murder. Number two, he's working for his father-in-law for 40 years. How do you spell failure? Working for your father-in-law for 40 years. That's how you spell failure. Can never, I bet his daddy-in-law finally said, I wonder when he's going to take over the business. 
You know, Moses has been with me now for 39 years, and he still ain't took over the business yet. He ain't stepped up. You know, many of us are like that as parents. Why? Wait till my kids to step up and take over something. But Moses ain't done it. 40 years, he looks at bushes on fire. When he sees a bush on fire, God speaks to him out of the bush and says, I want you to deliver my people. And Moses said, but, 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 but God, how? He said, I'll walk you through it. And you know what happened. The 10 plagues of pressure, amen, he puts on the children of Israel. He te- I mean, on, on Egypt, he, he throws down his stick and becomes a snake. He, he turns the water into blood. Frogs everywhere. I mean, the plagues, when I read about the plagues, I'm just amazed. I'm amazed at all the plagues. Bulls, you're talking about a pimple you can't get rid of. <laughs> Bulls all over your body. I mean, it hit, but there in Israel, if you study it, a little place called Goshen where the Israelites were, it, 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 there was no plague. There was no balls, there were no frogs, there was no bloody water. None of this happened to them. And finally, Pharaoh gets the word. He realizes he's, that, that he's got to let them go. After the children, the firstborn of, of, of Egypt die, he said, get out of here. Moses leaves. He gets to the edge of the promised land. The people have only heard about these miracles, but they've not seen one. They get to the edge of, of, not, I mean, to the edge of Sinai there, and when they get to the Red Sea, Moses stretches out his staff. I mean, he asked God. Lord, what do I do here? The enemy's coming on us. I got two million people behind me. I did what you told me. I, the water's at flood stage. What do I do? And God said, stretch out your staff. <laughs> and the waters peel back. And the people recognize it. And they cross all the way over to the other side. And then Moses throws the stick back up again. The waters come back together. This is what Habakkuk is talking about. God, I know what you did. Do you know when I'm reading my Bible, what I remind God? I know you healed the leper. I know that there were people that were lame, and you healed them. I know there were people that were blind, and you healed them. They couldn't hear, and you I remind God of this. And I go over and over. But like Habakkuk. And who believed God for it and stayed with it. This is the issue, church. And I taught this to the church in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, California. And I say it again. You already heard it. You believe God for the best. And you accept the verdict. You stay with Habakkuk. Believe God. God, I want you to save us. I want you to re- remember what you did. The testimony. You, you saved Israel. You did all of this. I'm the same way. And there are times I look at people and I say, I remember this one that had cancer. And that one there that had cancer. And I remember this one here that struggled with diabetes. And now they're healed. And they're healed. They're here. You're the same God. Do it for me. I'm believing God for the best. When I believe God for children, they didn't come my way when I wanted them. Then eventually God brought them through adoption. The issue is I believe God for the best. And I have to accept the verdict. There are times in life it doesn't turn out the way you want it, but it doesn't mean you can't ask for it. Yeah. Amen. When Pat Sharp was laying in the hospital bed, I saw him with my own eyes. I saw the tubes coming out of it. I saw the doctor take me out in the hallway without his wife Cindy and say to me, there's a good chance this man will die. He's not going to make it. He's had double aneurysms. And I look at his wife, and she's standing there believing God for the best. The same bass player that's up here and over here, she's hanging on to it. Sometimes God heals. And yet my own daughter had went to school with a young boy who died of an aneurysm last week. You don't know, but you got to ask. Amen. you got to keep believing God for it. you got to hang on to it. By faith, you got to keep on. You can't just give up. But Habakkuk's life, he saw destruction coming. He, called, he, called, he saw things. He said, God, you came out to deliver your people, to save your anointing. You, 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 you crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from the head to foot. Selah, with his own spear, you pierced his head. When his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though they're about to devour and wretched. Uh, who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses churning the great waters. When he looks at it, he said, you came out, God. You crushed them. You stripped them. You pierced them. You trampled them. This is what you did. Remember, God, you get all the credit. We need to remind ourselves how big God is. How just how big he is and how much that he does love us. First, no, an utter defeat to those who oppose God. There's coming a day, look, that the re- reason we rejoice is I have the greatest of confidence when I look through this book, when I live my life, that we're going to win this thing. Amen. That I will. And it, it's not about, and it's not about us beating up people or, or beating up the, the, the foreign nation. That's not, no, no, no. When I say we win, I'm talking about the kingdom of God will be ours and that people will turn toward Christ. I, I'm, when God says, I'm not willing that any should perish, I believe it. He's not willing to any Chinese, Japanese, Iranian, 
Amen. I, I, any Latin people, any American people, any Canadian people, maybe the French, but not the Canadians. Amen. <laughs> He's not willing that any should perish, but they all come to repentance. That to me is winning in our day. That, that we see that happen. Second, to have the divine determination to do whatever it takes to deliver God's people. You know, it, it, some people, got, you got to realize, if you've got a bigger God, you wouldn't worry as much. If you could just magnify Him, if you could make Him big, if you had a bigger God, you'd be stronger in the moment of crisis. If you had a bigger God, you'd be less tempted to compromise. Again, when this storm hit, when this, when this, this thing flew, I wouldn't see it coming. But yet I stand back and I realize, David is stronger. Joseph is stronger. Lori's stronger. Jill's stronger. I'm stronger. Skylar's stronger. The people that stood there, the many that I've talked to that have gone through this thing, it's like, because I, I asked them, how'd it go? Yeah, stronger. Yeah, Pastor, I prayed. God, hear me. Don't let it come any closer. And it didn't come any closer. That's good. Glad for you. <laughs> You're stronger. But we're getting stronger. Amen. We get, you get stronger through life. When crisis comes, if you get weaker, you need a bigger God. Amen. So I start closing with his testimony. I heard, and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at this sound. Decay crept into my bones, my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. In other words, he said, God, I understand you've got to judge us. But when you do judge us, I want you to understand that I'm going to wait patiently on it. And he even admits that he's decaying. That his earth suit is dying. I understand this. And it, it, to the best of my knowledge, Habakkuk was not even alive, Ken, when the Babylonians attacked Israel and did what they did. He was already, but he, he knew it was coming. You know, I stand here, and I'm, I'm the flip side. I know it's coming. What do I know? Coming? Not the impending judgment. I, I, I believe that may happen to America. But this is what I see coming. I see all my children turning toward God. I see me... Seeing those that I've pastored for years, I'll see them again in heaven. These are the things I see coming. I, I have this attitude shift like Habakkuk. And it literally is, it's not something I'm trying to preach up. I'm not trying to preach this up. It's already been tested. This is how my life has been. I literally, when it happened, looked at it and kind of smiled. I said, you know, you ought to come out to the ranch. We already mowed the grass. We got it looking good. So when you come and help us work, you'll say, my, isn't this a pleasant looking place? <laughs> Most of the stuff, thank God for those that have helped DJ, they come out and just started picking up stuff and getting stuff out to the front. It just looks better. It doesn't look like people don't care. It looks like somebody loves this place. And I'll be honest with you. If it happened to this church, that bunch out there would be here helping this church. Amen. We help each other. Until God does whatever he needs to do with us. So, so first, I get it, Lord. I understand. I get it. Our nation needs to turn to God. Not just toward him. And be honest. No one man in, 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 in Washington can turn this thing around. It's going to take you and the one sitting next to you to turn it around. It's going to take us turning toward God and not condemning and pointing fingers at one another. Amen. To see that happen. Second, there's a commitment. What faith looks like when life tumbles. Life is going to tumble. It's going to tumble. I'm reminded it. Where's Ramirez? In the back. Ramirez was with me on the way back after the flood. He saw pictures of his car underwater. Now, Earl, on behalf of Josiah, we want to appreciate you two for giving him that car to drive for the last two years. It came as a leftover. A convertible 04 Mustang. And the water was coming up, and I looked at Josiah in the truck. He was with me. He was preaching up and forth. I said, where are the keys? He said, they're in my pocket. <laughs> Impending doom. <laughs> well, how's the insurance? I just got liability. Oh, no. Hallelujah. <laughs> Years ago, when we met Josiah, we bought him a little Ford Ranger. I remember putting new mags on it. He drove it in from San Antonio to kind of show it off, and then Got caught in Harvey, flooded. And then that little Ford Ranger, he got that little Ford Mustang. And then I looked at him and I said, well, now what? He said, well, Pastor, it looks like my life's going to go from glory to glory to glory. I don't know what he's going to get next. Somebody let him borrow an old Ford work truck now. 
It looks like a yard service. <laughs> Everybody trying to pull him over to make him come over the grass. <laughs> Don't know what's going to happen. Though the fig trees does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and fields produce no food. Please underline this in your Bible. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. The word rejoice literally means to jump for joy. It means to exude excitement. How, how is that possible, God, when things are going bad? Habakkuk has described a total economic meltdown. Ancient Israel was an agricultural society. If you ran out of figs, grapes, grain, sheep, cattle, you were in big trouble. It wasn't a random list. He was making the list of what would happen. What if your investments disappeared tomorrow? Do you know I know people that serve God as long as he's a good time God. As long as things are good, they're going to serve him. As long as folk like them, they're going to serve him. As long as things are well, what would you do if the stock market crashed? Well, what would you, if it totally tanked and went to zero, your investments were gone, your pension was destroyed, there was no 401k, well, what you going to do? You know, I know people that have already gone through this, and I know that they still rejoice. Because we remember, this all came from God. Now, look, I don't care how bad things have gotten, I still don't have a two-holer out behind my house. Y'all forgot where I came from. I ain't drawing water up in a bucket. It's still coming out of a faucet. Life still ain't bad. Amen. It's all right. What, what, what if it totally tanked? Uh, you just got hit by your second major flood. What you going to do? I'm going to rejoice in the Lord my God. Amen. I'm going to keep on. Too, too many believers have a God of the good times. They serve God and they love Him and they praise Him when all is going well. But what will you do when hard times come? If all you got is the God of the good times, you ain't got the God of the Bible. This man, this God right here will put a man on a ship and then cause it to shipwreck. Let him float in. This man right here, this God right here will have a man build a fire and a snake bite him. Just to see what he's going to do after the snake bite. Of course, Paul shook it off back into the fire. He, he'll put a man through a life of prison, and then the door is opened by angels. He'll drop a man down inside of a lion's den. Three boys in a fire. Come on. I said he's the God. He's not the God of the good times. He's God of the Bible. Amen. But amongst it, there are some good times. Amen. Amen. When you serve him, there's still good times. But he gets you through all the other ones. Stand with me if you would. We often mistake faith and our feelings. Faith isn't about our feelings, much less about my circumstance. Faith chooses to believe when it'd be easier to stop believing. Habakkuk 319, he goes on to say, The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of deer. He enables me to go on the heights. When I have traveled through Colorado and California, and you get up and you'll get to see those rams running on the side of the mountain. And their feet are made for it. And that's what he's saying. That when you live by faith, you're able to walk where others can't walk. You're able to move like that. Ephesians 6 is therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand. He didn't say if the day of evil comes. He said when the day of evil comes. When things are turning sour and bad, it looks like the end. Stand. Stand. And that's what I want to see for our American churches, to stand. Amen. Because we're getting soft. And we have. Come on, let's admit it. We've gotten soft. But let's learn how to stand for God. Amen. Where we, this is the greatest nation on earth. I thank God he put me here. What my fault. Don't get mad at me. I was born in Alabama. <laughs> but I got here as quick as I could. Been here ever since. Habakkuk changed on the inside. Some of you are wrestling today. You're wrestling with what God has done, what you think he's done, what you forgot. Sometimes it was our own choices that put us in the place we're at. I will rejoice. 
The only thing you can change in your life is your attitude. The shifting in your thinking. Because blaming God is never going to get you any higher. It's only going to bring you deeper. It's going to keep you in a place of, of depression. It's going to put you in a place of negativity. But if I can start looking up like this man did. And say, God, I see impend if impending doom is coming. Okay, I'm going to rejoice in you. Because right now on this day, I don't feel the impending doom. I feel blessing. My feet on solid ground. I'm believing you for the best. See, in life, you're either coming out of confusing times. Or you're in confusing times. Or you're about to go into confusing times. You're in one of those three. Did I, is that, on, is that an overhead statement? Okay, I'll say it again then. You're either coming out of confusing times. It's like daylight. I'm coming out. Or you're either in confusing times. I don't know what's going on. Confusion is that. Crazy train. Merry-go-round. What do we call them when we was in school? Like a uh, merry-go-round, but a lazy, they got the lazy Susan. So, some of you have never heard this story. But years ago, as a little boy, my brother and I, before school started, New Bethel Junior High School, would go out and get on that merry-go-round. It's, 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 it's horizontal, it's on the ground. And you crawl over in the middle of it, and you get hold of the bar. And you push that bar around like this right here, and the others get hold on to it. And if you get it going fast enough, the ones that are holding on won't get airborne. Mm -hmm. So it's right before school. They outlawed these things. Now they made them solid. So you can't get in the middle of them. Because what would happen if you got in the middle of one of them and you fail? And you can't get up till that thing quits spinning. Because if you try to come up, it's going to hit you in the back of the head and you're going to miss first and second period. <laughs> All right? So every morning before school, we get out on that thing. And life is like, it, it gets this way at times. And my brother and I, he's one year younger than me, Jimmy. And, and so we, we hanging on to that thing. And, and we're spinning around. Now, you got to picture it in your mind as you pull up to New Bethel Junior High. And you're coming on the gravel. And right here is that little merry-go-round. And right here is a big pine tree. And right here is grass. So we, we own this thing. And, and it ain't no fun being the pusher unless you can sling those that are hanging on off. It's competition, man. It's, it's like, can I sling you off of here? Because I ain't here to give you a free ride. So my brother and I, we hanging on one morning, and we spinning around that thing. And my, my friend's in the middle, probably Bill Rex and David A. in there pushing that thing around and around. And we hanging on, and all of a sudden our feet get up in the air. And we floating, man. We flying. And we hear that first bell ring that tells you in a few minutes you're going to be tardy. So the bell going off, we up in the air. We swing, and all of a sudden my brother, he, he looks over at me, and he goes, Jerry, I can't hold on. So I yell back at him, Jimmy, when I say let go, let go. Okay? Okay. So I got to judge this thing because it's got a tree, grass, and gravel. And the faster you go, you see tree grass gravel, tree grass gravel, tree grass gravel, tree grass gravel. Right, right, right? Tree grass gravel, tree grass gravel. So I said, Jimmy, wait, sit, let go. I misjudged it just by a little bit. We missed the gravel, we missed the grass, but we hit the tree. I never forget walking into the building. Skin up and bloody. He had the bell going on. Still tardy when I walked in. I never forget that dizzy feeling, that walking like that. And I, I meet people at times. And you're running with folk telling you to let go at the wrong. Shouldn't have been on the swing to start with. <laughs> but the bottom line is that you got dizzy. And that's how life is. Confusing times. You're in it. You don't know when to let go. You don't know whether to keep hanging on. And then on the other side is you're coming you're coming, uh, you're about to go into confusing times. So you're either in it, out of it, or going into it. At that time, do among us, as Habakkuk said, do among us what you did among them. Work among us as you worked among them. And as you bring judgment, remember mercy. Everybody say, remember mercy. Remember mercy. I'll leave you with a final thought. You'll never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you got. 
And there are times you'll be standing on the, on the edge of a business that is destroyed. Uh, perhaps even a marriage, a home that's flooded. Um, and you'll look at it and you'll say, God, I, I don't know what to do next. But as long as I got you, I got hope. I got hope. Heads bowed for a moment. Those watching by the internet. Who knows where we're at economically. But what I believe in God for is for attitudes to adjust and shift. See, the one thing I know about Scripture is that when Paul and Silas sang in the prison, you interrupted the second verse, destroyed the jail, and set them free for a jailer's sake. So God, whatever we're going through in life, let our heads stay up. Let our attitudes be adjusted. And let us give you praise. Now I'd like, uh, in Jesus' name, everybody say, amen. We're going to have some prayer in just a minute. We're going to, matter of fact, open the altars to pray for you. I'm going to bring David up and Joseph up. And I'm going to have uh, Ken come up and some swap. But before I do, I'd like for Liz and Larry, Carrie and Bug to come up here and stand with me. I, there are five, the Bible talks about fivefold ministry. In other words, in the body, just stand right back here, guys. In the fivefold ministry, five, there are apostles, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. Teach. There are prophets, there are evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, in that fivefold ministry, there are giftings. Some people just, they're a solid, they're just good at pastoring. Some are evangelists. They're always reaching other people. Some are teachers able to teach. But there's one gift that I'm very thankful for in my life. And I didn't ask for it, but it's, it's been discovered through 26, 27 years of pastoring. And even that was the other ministry. And that is an apostolic ministry. When I say apostolic, I'm not talking about Pentecostal long hair, running, shouting, bucking, and jerking. I'm talking about an apostle has the ability to send out, to draw in, to build up, and at times to tear down. And that's been my life. God's used me, and again, it's the gifting, to, to bring people in. Somebody told me if I started a church in the woods, people would find me. And that was before I ever started a church in the woods. You know, that, that there's this, if I started on a medium in the highway, people would find a chair and sit there. I, and and I, I, I'm, I'm um, honored that that would be this, the case. The issue is simply this. I have a great joy to send people out of this church. To send people to go somewhere else. When people come to me and say, Pastor, I'm le you know, if I get a phone call that God said for us to move, I kind of laugh at that. Because normally that means you don't want to face me. You don't want to talk to me and that you got offended, hurt, or whatever. And then you slipped out and I ain't heard from you since. On the other hand, I can't tell you how many people over 26 years I have sent out of a church. And how many people we've blessed that have come in. I've been with people even this week and said, Pastor, I, I got a couple, got six foot of water in their house. And said, that's it. We're moving. We're moving to Tennessee. We're going to miss you, Pastor. We'll watch you online, but we're going to miss this church. We can't do this anymore. I will pray over them and send them out to Tennessee. Now watch this. When they get to Tennessee, they'll be wearing little country church shirts. They'll be representing. They'll be saying stuff like, what we do here matters there. They'll be saying all kind of stuff they've heard from this house. Because they can't help it. They already saying it in California. Stuff that I've taught y'all here. They, they pick up on it quick. <laughs> We're going to send this couple out to a place called Cushing, Texas. Up by Nacogdoches. Now let me just say this. They have been my friends. My confidant. They have uh, watched Bug grow up. Uh, I gave him boots. <laughs> yeah, he did. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I can't tell you what certain people mean to me. And people think at times, you know, you, you may, if you left, you might say, oh, I miss pastor. But when people leave me, they're part of my life. They, they become my brothers and sisters. Joseph was right. I mean, I, I probably know everybody in here somehow, some way, you know, connected and, and still connecting. So to see somebody leave, I got to bless them. I got to thank them for the work they've done. Hurricane Harvey, this, 
this family right here, they would have stilled it till it was over. This, heart, this hurricane here, I said, Lord, uh, can you delay their leaving yet for a year? <laughs> but then God started having other people step up. And he always does and always will. Amen. So whenever you're right through Nacogdoches in that area, you got family to look up, go by and see. Uh, but they're gonna, they'll be coming back down to be riding scooters with us. They'll be hanging out. And I know some of you are very close. Marie, Robert, y'all come on up here. You're very close to them. Anyone else that, that's uh, brother and sister here? But we're going to pray over them. We're going to kick them out of church. Let me find them. Larry, Liz, Carrie, Bug. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. Paul said, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. From the first day till now, been with you a long time. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, in New Caney, will carry it on to completion in Cushing, Texas. That's not in there. I added that. <laughs> Until the day of Jesus. Yes. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you sharing God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ. And this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So that you may be able to discern what is best. And may be pure and blameless until the day of Jesus. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. To the glory and praise of God. I thank God for you as family and friends. We send you forth with the blessing of the little country church. We, uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen there. I know God has a plan for you there. I know that there's got to be a house of God there somewhere, a place of connection. You're going to be a blessing. Larry, I remember when you first came in, you, you, as a man, you scouted out to church first before you brought your wife and your family. I thank God for that. That's what men do. So you showed us what being a man is like. You've been a man who has forgiven, you, uh, forgiven others. You, you, I've watched you forgive me. You've gone with me to Florida to work. We've done things together. Liz, you stepped up in the kitchen in so many ways. Carrie, everybody has one of your T-shirts. <laughs> Bug, we watched you grow. So if you stretch your hands this way, Larry, Liz, if you take this bandana from me. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for Liz, Larry, Carrie, and Bug. I ask your blessing to be upon them as they send forth from this building. I ask God that you would strengthen them, that you would give them the, the uh, imagination to remember all the things that took place here at Little Country, so, God, so that they can remember it. God, I ask you to bring to remembrance the word of the Lord in their lives, to give them strength through the hard times. I thank you that they're there to comfort family who is literally passing from this earth. God, I ask you to give them uh, uh, the, uh, the affirmation that they're doing the right thing, the confirmation from this house. We confirm it, God. We thank you. They're retired. They, they, they've earned it. Bless them. Strengthen them. Let this be a time of rejoicing in their life. And God, we will see them probably more than they recognize or realize. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now I'm going to have...